Welcome back to the podcast where we discuss the plausibility of sci-fi concepts with experts. I'm your host, Heidi Campo, and today we have a very special episode. This will be the first book that we are featuring on the show, and I would like to welcome Kim McGee, the author of the brilliant series, The Time Patriot which is a science fiction masterpiece that explores the concept of a group of modern time travelers from the 2030s who travel back in time to 1780s to find George Washington and convince him to come back in time with them and help stop an imminent civil war. We're going to be talking about time travel, history, politics, corruption, and exploring what the Founding Fathers intended for our country through the story brought to life by Kim. I know that many of you have some kind of a reading goal with your New Year's resolution list, so I wanted to encourage listeners to consider checking out the Time Patriot series. And since this is Reality Check, we will still be scoring a concept at the end, but I also don't want to spoil the book for you, so at the end of this episode, I will ask him to rank, in his opinion, from one to five, how likely it would be for a founding father to be able to fix modern politics assuming we could time travel, and they agreed to come back with us. So without further ado, let's get ready for another mind-blowing episode of Reality Check. Kim, welcome to the show. Let's kick things (laughs) off by telling us a little bit about how you got the idea for your book. Well, it was pretty interesting to me anyway. You know, I've always been a fan of time travel. I'd written several time travel stories already. And Martha and I are are retired from active participation in the workforce. So um, we watch a lot of television. And we do find ourselves, a lot of news programs, I should say, we follow politics more than most people do. And we find the people on the TV say the stupidest things and stuff that is just completely ridiculous. And, uh, I mean, sometimes as a politician, sometimes as a newscaster, whatever. And uh, so I just kind of wondered out loud. I said, I wonder what our founding fathers would think about what we've done with this experiment in democratic republic. And Martha said, well, you got a time machine. Why don't you go ask them? That's that's what came up with the idea. I went, hmm. You know, I thought, well, that might be a good good study. And uh, uh, originally we thought about Thomas Jefferson. Um, the reason we thought it, well, we actually, we first thought of George Washington first and they went, everybody probably does George Washington. Let's do somebody else, you know? And, uh, so we started thinking about Thomas Jefferson and then when I started doing some research, I found out he was out of the country at the time. Uh, when they did the constitution, he was ambassador to France. So he wasn't involved in any of that stuff at all. Um, so then we started looking at other people and we found out and uh, there's a book called the quartet about them um that there's uh george washington alexander hamilton john jay and james madison they were the four people who kicking and screaming helped the people in the united states come forward to actually accept another boss right i mean they just got rid of the british and now they're going to get somebody local to do the same thing, right? Um, one of my good friends says, old boss, same as the new boss, you know? Well, let's back it up just a little bit here. So your wife said, well, hey, you've got a time machine. Why don't you go ask them? Right. And she was referring to your first books that you had already written because right. you were an established author before you even started the series. Correct. So. Can you explain to me a little bit about this time machine that you created in your universe? Because in sci-fi, there is a lot of different concepts of time travel. Uh, Cause you know, we haven't really proved it yet. We haven't done it. There's a lot of theories. So what, um, what kind of theories did you explore when you were creating your time machine in this universe? And what uh, theory did you go with for the time Patriot? Okay. There's, there's a couple of questions in there. Uh, there's actually two ways to do science fiction. Um, one way is to uh, is to go into detailed explanation about all the mechanics and the physics, and the, I call that hard science fiction. And then there's another kind called soft science fiction, where you you present the idea and and the and the reader makes a leap of faith 
to to say, okay, all right, I'm going to assume that's possible. Let's see what happens now. And my story is really more about people um, and about a- actions and stuff than they are about the science. That having been said, one of the, one of the uh, time travel things, uh, time travel theories I really liked it. It was in a movie, the movie called uh, Timeline by Michael Crichton was the book it comes from. I loved that book. That's it's, one of my favorite books. It's an awesome book. And uh, and uh, they made a great movie out of it with Ger- Gerard Butler, who might have been the biggest heartthrob in the country at the time. Uh, I know he, he was and, mine when that movie came out. <laughs> yeah, he did such a great job in the show. And it was uh, a young guy who was uh, popular from one of the... Uh, one of the car, a lot of the car movies. I can't remember his name now. Um, um, that was Paul Walker. Paul Walker, right? Exactly. And he was a big heartthrob, and 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 he did a good job. But I think Gerard Butler stole the show. <laughs> it's an awesome movie. But their idea was the way they put it was that basically your atoms were reduced to a stream, and it's like a fax machine going across. Um, which uh, one of the problems is if you win a lot of time, just like you fax something, then you fax it, get that, and then you fax it to somebody else, it eventually deteriorates. And in that in that book, the same thing happened to the people as they were moved, as they were, you know, made more and more trips. Their their body just started to deteriorate. You know, uh, uh, for example, like blood vessels might not line up correctly. And that kind of stuff, which is, is all very dangerous. And you bring up timeline because I read that as a young child, an elementary school kid, and I remember when the movie came out, I was still a child, and so that was that was one of my first um, sci-fi books that exposed me to time travel. So it's so crazy to me that you're explaining this concept because I was like, yes, that's the one I'm most familiar with. So yeah, it's another fun one. So. Um... The way I approached it in my first book, the idea was that the scientist who invented time travel um, was a Trekkie, and he was trying to develop a warp engine, and he had a disconnect and was testing it, and at some point, an a total accident, he's touching it when, it when it goes off, and it throws him 25 years in the past. And so he's, you know, he was in his 50s, now he's in his 20s. And he goes back into the same office he was working in where he was a young guy, uh, a new professor. And so now there's two of them. And he has no way to get back. So uh, he ends up, you know, he and he and his uh, younger self uh, work forward using the two of them. They're both very brilliant guys and they bounce stuff off of each other and they developed a way to take care uh, to to make it work and return. So. Uh, that's in the first book called Time Limits. And uh, that's a playback to, in, in my time travel, you can go any year that's a 25-year multiple of where you are right now, um, in the future or in the past. In other words, you could go 25 years, 25 years ago, 50, 75, 100, like that. And As a educator, is there a reason right. why you chose 25? Yeah, well, it just seemed like a good number to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a good enough answer. Yeah, there's no, there's no physics or anything calculations behind. It. I just thought, um, so because I did end up with three generations of the same guy working together. So one of them, uh, and and at the time of uh, the books, one of them is about a hundred years old. One's about seventy five. The other is about fifty. So. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of other things I won't go into, but uh, the, uh, they they continue to be working on their warp engine ideal, and they're also working, um, you know, uh, coming up with new features for the time machine, like uh, a flexible return beacon, like in Timeline, they had a return beacon that they had around their neck, and they pressed that to come back, right? And so um, they eventually ended up uh, uh, over the course of four books. They ended up with uh, the ability to program in several, uh, several locations. Each time you clicked it, you went to the next one. 
and uh, also that they could hook their cell phones through it to send messages, to send status messages. I kind of ignored the fact that the people in the future, uh, you know, no matter where they were coming from, the message was going to come. <laughs> but, and <not> like, <laughs> like it, you know, like they go, they're gone. Okay. Oh, here's a message, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and we can, we can, and that's the beauty of fiction is we can glaze over those little things so we can still enjoy the whole plot together. That's right. Um, and, um, I mentioned, mentioned to you before the show, um, uh, that I introduce a lady, a lady ranger, who is uh, really tough. And uh, there's this thing in the first book where uh, I, I picked a couple things. Did you ever see the Time Machine with Guy Pierce, his version? I feel like I did. Uh, yeah. Can you jog my memory or explain well, it to the audience? Um, well, it's it's kind of a it's it's a new take it was a new take on the original hg wells uh sh uh right uh book and um so but at the end uh they have the morlocks who are the villains he goes way way in the distant future and uh there's a morlock who tries to grab a hold of him and he hits the time machine button and he jumps out of there and of course the guy, part of part of them is inside the bubble, and part of them is outside. So it's just like truncated, mm -hmm. him. and so ugly death. Um, and so I had a, a situation when they were testing the time machine, uh, when my guys were testing the time machine, and uh, uh, they what they would do is they have it kind of like a little lawnmower thing, and put it out on a platform, and then hit the button and send them someplace with a certain voltage and certain settings. And then it would have a camera that pointed straight up at the sky and they did it out in New Mexico. So um, when it came back, they would see the position of the stars in the sky and could get an estimate of where, what year it was. So that's how they were testing that. And it comes back one time and is really kind of, uh, um, uh, it looks like it's got something piled on top of it. So one of the guys runs over to it and he gets way too close before he realizes it's a diamondback rattlesnake. And and it jumps at him and he falls down, but it lands right next to him. And this lady ranger jumps on it. I mean, she just jumps on it, grabs it by the head and by the tail. And uh, so uh, it was an opportunity to develop two characters. Only one of them was in the rest of that story. That's in the first book, uh, Time Limits. But that lady is a main character in the next three books, really. Uh, yeah. And her name is her name in the story is Karen Hatcher. Uh, yeah, that yeah. Thing. Terry Hatcher. <laughs> okay. And I I don't want this episode to include spoilers. Usually, I don't care about ruining my movies because if you haven't seen you know Jurassic Park by now, then you, <laughs> this is probably not the right. podcast that you'd be interested in. But I do want people to read these books. So I'm not going to give too much away, but okay. I do think it's really funny when um, your ranger, when she does meet Washington, and it's like, I think we can give that away. It's like they do yeah. successfully travel back in time. That's the whole point of the book. Right. Um, and she meets Washington and he's just so confused. He's like, you have women in the military, but yeah. he was such a forward thinking person that he accepted it pretty quickly he was like okay this can make sense for me based on the logic that you're providing so right. can you tell us about your process of learning about washington and bringing him to life because the washington you created in these books i think is the most vivid and personable washington that i've ever read about personally i can tell you a little bit about it i uh I got a hold of what I was looking for was once we figured out we couldn't use uh, couldn't use um, uh, Thomas Jefferson and we found the quartet and then I focused on it and everything I saw said that Washington was the main driver of the Constitution. So I said, OK, what about George Washington? How can we pick how, what can we do for him? And uh, so I started thinking, where do where would given our 25 year multiple thing and they're in 2037 what where can they intersect washington and uh in 1787 that's 250 years back so that's a multiple the uh 
interesting thing about it is that from the end of the war in 1783 and when they get everything going for the for the United States in 1780, he went back to being a farmer. And that's what he did. And it went back to his uh, to his engineering around his farm. But I and so I was thinking, how do I get this? How do I get this guy by himself to have a minimum of, of interruption and, and least impact to history? And uh, so, uh, luckily, <laughs> when when, uh, when Washington was part of the Virginia Volunteers who uh, fought against the Indians and the French in the French and Indian War, uh, Washington was uh, uh, a young uh, young lieutenant, I believe, and actually inadvertently caused a major scandal. Uh, he went with some Indians and he's trying to meet peaceably and talk to some guys. And one of the Indians goes over and whacks the guy in the head with an ax. And so, uh, uh, so Washington got in a lot of trouble about that. But overall, because of what all he did do, he was re rewarded by a property on the other side of the Alleghenies. And so where that comes into play is he frequently went during that period, 1783 to 70, he would get on his horse and go with his uh, uh, manservant, William Lee, a slave, William Lee, uh, and maybe a couple of other people, sometimes with a bigger entourage, but he would go across the mountains, across the mountains of Virginia and into the Allegheny area and to check on the property he had and, you know, kick off squatters or get them to start paying rent or whatever. So that was an excellent opportunity to catch him while he's making that journey uh, with a small group. And so it was easy to get there and actually have him by himself. <laughs> and uh, That's one thing I really appreciated about this book, because sometimes you read or watch sci-fi and it's just so far fetched that it just takes me out of the story and I'm just rolling my eyes like this is just ridiculous. But your characters, like their even their thought process, because when they're having their their meeting, they're like, "Hey, where can we get him? Well, why don't we just jump forward this time?" But like, no, that's not going to work. It, he's already has these things going on. So there was a lot of history built into this, and I feel like it was, I like I got, I, I'm a little embarrassed to admit I'm not the biggest history buff, but I was even learning along with this, and it was a fun way for me to learn. So you have a pretty healthy background in history did you have to do a lot of extra research um to bring the story to life i did do a lot of research um my idea about science fiction is that as i said before you want to build something and have a leap of faith that the person says okay i'll believe that and then okay if i believe that you know i'll i'll pretend that's true i'm i'll make that leap of faith and then see where the story goes. So I'm a firm believer in making that leap as small as possible. So uh, so what I tried to do is really try to figure out where Washington was, what, what he was thinking about. Uh, and uh, all during this time, he was corresponding with, with other patriots about the fact that the Articles of Confederation were not working. Because, and if we'd kept them, and that, that's one part of the story. If Washington is not there for the convention, there's a good chance that the Constitution never gets written or ratified. And we exist on the Articles of Confederation, which is not unlike, not seriously unlike the European Union. You got all these countries that do what they want to do. And they, they're tied together by the European Union. But when it comes down to their area, they're going to do what they got to do. It's interesting. In the Washington you you painted for us, you know, the, the fact that he, when he got done in the military with his service, and he did have this period where he went back and he, he worked as a farmer, it almost makes me kind of think of the character Maximus from Gladiator when Caesar yes. asks him, he asks him, please, will you come be emperor? And he's like, with all my heart, no, I, I want to go back to my farm and my family. And it it kind of is that reminder that some of the greatest leaders don't necessarily want to lead. They just want to live a humble, quiet life on their farm with their family, but they see a great need and they they feel the call to that leadership. 
not because they want it, not because they want the power or the glory, but because they, it's the servant leadership. And that I see that with Maximus as a character. And I see that with the way he brought Washington to life is that servant leadership and how he truly just wanted to be a humble guy living on his farm, enjoying his life. But he felt the call of duty and he responded. Yeah, he did. And uh, he was an interesting guy. I learned a few things about him that I had no idea about. Like what? Well, one is that he he had a legendary stink eye. In other words, if you said something he didn't agree with, you could tell it by looking at his face. And uh, That's something that him and I have in common. <laughs> that's right. So, well, I don't know that for, as as uh, from my experience with you, but but it's right. I mean, you know, he apparently, you know, somebody uh, said something he thought was stupid, or said something that he vehemently didn't agree with. He would give that look, and everybody knew where they stood with him. I suspect, you know, it's part of like you know wearing your heart on your sleeve. He probably was like that. Except he wasn't a he wasn't a sentimental man, but he was. Uh, but he he did let you know where he stood. He was always a, about honesty. Um, yeah, my, other... my dad's gonna my dad is gonna get a kick out of that when he listens to this part because uh, I love you, dad. That one's for you. <laughs> well, the and another thing was uh, a lot of people don't know about this. He didn't have any children of his own, but he um, but when he married Martha. Um, she had two children. And uh, so the way it worked back in those days, if the father passed away, then the the children and the mother got equal shares. So if you have two kids, there's three shares, one for one kid, one for the second kid, and the other one for the wife. So when Washington married Martha, the only part of the for fortune he had was what was her share. But it was a, a good step up for him. He, uh, he went into the military because he was not the first son. You know, the first son gets the property, gets the name, is in charge of carrying the name on. He was not the first son. So basically that person has to make their way however they can. And he was a surveyor and all that that everybody knows about. But he, he joined the army because he saw it as a way to prosper. And uh, he loved being in the British army. Uh, oh, he was actually in the... In the uh, colonial troops right for virginia and uh he um he took his his uh responsibility to those kids very very seriously it's his job to be steward over those two shares that belong to the kids who were just little kids at the time so um he was really really um uh tight with his money and uh one thing that a lot of people don't know is that even after the war with England, a lot of the uh, landed gentry in Virginia uh, would still work with a clearinghouse in England to buy stuff. They send them a note, say, uh, I want you to get me a carriage. You know, how much is it? OK, buy one for me and send it to me here in the States. And so uh, th there's a lot of evidence that Washington thought he was being cheated by those folks. And he was uh, he was pretty adamant about uh, letting them know that he thought he was being cheated. The record, uh, the official record, does not show that uh, there, there's no record or nothing to indicate that they ever cheated. It. It's just that he was, you know, he was going to make sure he wasn't cheated. So he took that. So he took his reputation that way. Uh, he didn't want to. I mean, he considered. He considered long and hard before going to the Constitutional Conference uh, because he knew that if he went there, he would be lending his reputation and everything to it. And if it turned out badly, then that would be a stain on his uh, record. And so he was a lot about uh, propriety and about being perceived as, as a gentleman, as a very knowledgeable and educated gentleman. So that's a... Uh... So that kind of paints a picture a little bit on how you developed his character. Um, did you take many, if any, creative liberties with creating Washington? Well, I guess, of course, you did take some creative liberties <laughs> with dialogue and whatnot. 
Um, yeah. but what kind of created liberties did you take with depicting the 1780s and or um, the the lifestyles? Um, I tried not to take any. <laughs> if I did, it's purely by accident and my fault. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, most most of the stuff you read about, you don't you don't really hear about. Um, you don't hear about the personal side of some of these guys back then, and uh, a, a great example uh, of what we know and what we don't know. Washington, just like everybody else, there the paintings that we see, they probably don't look more than just sort of like the person really looked. Because if you were a painter back then, you got paid only if the person liked the picture. So if you pay- these days, yeah, people people will use the app if it has the best filters. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so, uh, so if somebody painted his picture. Uh, um, I mean, we know he he had smallpox when he was young, and he had some scars on the on one side of his face, and he always tried to favor not showing that side in any picture or anything. But it didn't matter because when they painted them, they were not going to show those cars anyway. Um, so, you know, he might, if he came here today, he you look at him and go, the guy looks familiar. Where have I seen that guy before? You know, uh, and uh, it would just be because we've seen all these pictures. But all of the pictures, if you notice, all the pictures look kind of different. So I'm looking up right now, because I'm kind of curious how tall he was. Um, and it's saying that he was six two. Uh huh. That is not just tall for our current times, but that is very tall for historical times. It was. Pretty do you think tall. that's accurate, or do you think that's an embellishment? No, I think it's accurate. I think it's accurate. He was known for being just like Thomas Jefferson was known for being tall. I think he was taller. Really. And that you know. And I, so the average height for men in the 1780s was about five feet and 10 inches. So yeah, these founding right. fathers were truly towering figures over their uh, right. colleagues. Yeah. I used to work with a guy uh, when I was at Bell South. I worked with this guy and he was six seven. Whenever he wanted to make a point at the conference table, he would always manage for some reason to stand up. And, and he said, You'd be amazed at how many people will consider you a figure of authority if if you're big. And so he used it better than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, he never did anything threatening. He just would stand up at certain times, you know, and and uh, say some and long ar- outstretched arms, you know, and uh, just all encompassing. Plus, he was really smart, so that helped too. Well, and that's kind of interesting because I I don't know what the exact statistic is and I'm not going to look it up, but it there is something to be said for tallness. And I apologize to all my short kings out there listening, but this is just, you know, this is just a thing. Most of our presidents are taller people and most CEOs and people in positions of power do tend to be taller. And for whatever reason, it is that deep psychological reason that there's like sort of that um authority that they sort of evoke so let's kind of start to bring uh washington into our modern world so he would look like you just said he would he would look like someone kind of familiar maybe a little bit different he wouldn't be much shorter than modern day people because historical people were usually a lot smaller he probably wasn't very muscular because they weren't nourished the same way as us. So he was right. just, you know, kind of a tall, skinny guy. But bringing him kind of into our modern world, um, what are kind of some of your more thoughts on on that without giving away too much of the book? Well, um, I think if you can imagine, um, let's say, you know, the only thing you know about electricity is that your friend Ben has been trying to capture lightning in a jar. That's it. No a- applications, nothing. And uh, there's no central heating or any central air. And you bring that guy to the present. So he comes into what would be like a gymnasium room. The uh, the uh, It's the lab at the... Uh, um, uh, it's the hero lab. And I'll... Uh, I do want to jump in real quick to say, okay, he, hero stands for hi, uh, historical 
event research organization. Just it comes from an act by Congress, and I intentionally made it cringeworthy because uh, I mean, you know, Congress is famous for naming stuff that isn't what it is, you know, and uh, so. Uh, uh, but they re really are kind of heroes, you know. The lead character is Mark McKnight, so he's kind of got Knight in his name, and he's Army Ranger, which, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, is also a knight a ranger is a knight so uh there's there's a lot of things there that we were working with uh but if he came into any room and he goes what's that sound you know and we're like what do you mean and uh, like you hear the hum from the lights if you have that kind of lighting you would hear the air rushing through the uh through the um uh, duck work in the building um and you hear the hum from the electronics. And so he's like, what's all that? Because he's not used to any of that. Plain noisy. Right. And then when you go outside, there's airplanes, there's car noise, it's all kinds of things. Um, I, I just thought, you know, what if he rides in a car and he's sitting looking out the side window trying to see things and everything's rushing by really, really fast. Uh, my oldest daughter, well, both my daughters used to get really sick in the car, uh, looking out the window until I finally figured out, tell them, don't look at what's right there. Look at what's way over there. And because they would, they'd get ill, you know? And so, uh, and I think my favorite thing that I put it in one of the books, uh, uh, one of, in that story was when the president of the United States lands in, uh, in Mount Vernon out on the Bowling Green in a helicopter. And you got it, you know, if you've ever heard one of those things, they really make a huge amount of racket up close. And uh, so you can see him sitting in his his traditional home of Mount Vernon, and he hears some huge, god-awful racket. And uh, so that's another example of things. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time with that, uh, trying to figure out how to... You know, how, to, how would uh, Washington react to those things? And that's, and that's like just so fascinating to even think about because you even think if, if modern, if us right now were transported that far into the future, what kind of technologies are going to exist that we can't even, con like we can't even conceptualize what they would be like because we don't even have that technology yet. It's like, what's the equivalent of the, t of the electricity breakthrough? It's like those future technologies might seem like magic to us. And that's also, you know, it's, it's, uh, what is it? Compounding. It's exponential. So it's always going faster and faster. But what about our politics? I, I'm really curious to talk to you about this because this is kind of the big premise of the book, right? Is we have the politics that America was founded on versus where politics are at now. So where, uh, so how much of it's similar and how much of it's different? That's a great question. Um, so, uh, to give, to give your listeners an idea of the, the premise of the book is that, um, the political divisions that we're seeing now don't get resolved. They escalate and they move further and further apart to the point that there's about to be a civil war. And, uh, the president, Wade Harrison is the name. He's just been elected president in, uh, um, uh, 2036 It's it's, it's, uh, in early February, so he's just been president a few days, and he he's looking for some way to unite people, and he figured that he needed to find somebody that everybody would listen to. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, can you think of anybody now that people on the left and on the right would listen to? I think it would need to be a Superman-like alien who came yeah. from planet Krypton, who is a nonpartisan demigod that people would listen to at this point. Right. And, and so he had time travel. And so he thought, okay, let me send a team back to find George Washington and try to get him to come forward, look at what's happening today and then make observations and, uh, you know, tell everybody what, and, and so he, uh, uh, two of the things he's really, uh, he he sees, which, you know, uh, we had no income tax back then. 
we didn't have income tax until the early uh, early 1900s. And so when we started having the income tax, I mean, and they didn't want to have a tax because that's, that's why they split up from Great Britain. That's why they got a divorce. Boy, they threw the tea in the ocean. <laughs> right, exactly. There's a series, on, a new series on, on uh, Fox Nation, I think, with Rob Lowe talking about that. It looks, look, it looks really interesting. Um, so um, the long and the short of it is he's going to see several things. One, he's going to see um, a media that no longer talks about the truth. Uh, uh, it's well, it's not everybody's truth. Uh, they talk about they have an agenda. Um, when I was younger, you'd have the news on uh, the news, straightforward, on a certain point, and then you would have political commentators after that. But it never entered into the broadcasting, the news broadcasts. It was that was all just straight error. But that's. Uh, for example, there was a classic guy, Walter Cronkite, who was a newscaster for many years. And you really couldn't tell if he was a Democrat or a Republican. You had no idea because he just gave the news and that's it, you know. Uh, but today, it all gets mixed up. And then um, one of the things that I, I really am disappointed in, that there's a lot of Americans who are more interested in their political party than they are their country. You know, their loyalty is their party, not their country. And they, on both sides, right? Yeah, and back then liberal, the parties whatever. were very, yeah, and back then the parties were very different. We, um, uh, again, guys, I'm not a history buff. I'm a sci-fi person. So we had the Quakers and the Democrats, right? The, uh, the Republicans came later. We we did, we had, a, oh my gosh, you text my memory now. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> But uh, is what we're but they, had, they had Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And what that was about was, do we have a central, lead, a central hub that coordinates all the different states? In the Constitution, the last part of the Constitution uh, says all the other things are left to the states. You know, all, the, it's not a, a list of what the government is charged to do. It's a list of of limitations on the government. This is what they can do and nothing more than this. And everything else left to the states. And so, uh, and the way it should be, anything that's, uh, or at least the way I see it, if you're a strict constitutionalist, then if it's not in the Constitution, then it should be managed by the states. And uh, we've gone way past that, of course. Uh, they would, uh, one of the things Washington would, would note would be the intrusiveness of the government today, and uh, he would he would know that the government has their figures in a lot of stuff that they shouldn't be. Historically, what was the limitations of the government that has changed from then to now? Oh well, it was very finely defined. Um, the idea is that the uh, the uh, legislative body and the executive body and the judicial body were separate entities. And they put them at odds to each other on purpose so that if one gets out of line, the other two will snap them back in place. However, once political party becomes more important than the, than the country, then you see, um, you, you see uh, the three branches lining up differently. And, you know, you may have one branch that wants to go too far and, and the other one, the people in another branch of the same political party, you say, oh, yeah, let's say, let's, and if, if they're not, if they're, they're um, not balanced within each, each, uh, uh, each part of the government, each third of the government, if they're not balanced, then you're going to end up with basically, for example, maybe the courts and the, uh, and the legislative branch being in cahoots with each other. We want to ram this through. Somebody's going to challenge it, and the Supreme Court's going to hold us up. I'm not as good to support us, is what I mean. So Washington probably noticed right away um, that we do have these very polarizing parties that are at odds with each other, and that was probably one of the. I have I I have all the books here with me again, guys. Please check out these books; they're so much fun. I got all four of them in the series. They're not too hard to read. So again, if you have read more books on your 
uh, New Year's resolution list this year, please check these out. And we will be linking where you can get them. Um, and then the other thing I was just in the middle of saying something is I totally lost my train of thought. Kim, go ahead. I, I do it all the time. Um, what I was going to say is, as I was reading The Return of George Washington, that also covers the writing, how they did everything with the Constitution, and then they had to go sell it to each of the states. They did one thing that if they had not done it, they, uh, it would have never passed, and that is within them, to a man, every one of the founding fathers said, okay, there are some things about this that I don't like, but I'm not going to point that out. I'm just going to say this is the best we can do, and I'm going to try to get them to approve it because it's better than what we got now. And so that's how they sold it. But there was infighting like you would not believe. And I thought, when I was reading, I thought, golly, this sounds like today. Uh, and it's true that, you know, back then they had people just as passionate, just as convinced they were right, um, just as convinced that they uh, needed something. As a matter of fact, one of the first things that happened was there was a group of folks wanted to do a carve out in the Constitution to give them special privileges. You know, the Constitution is supposed to say everything applies to everybody. And they Equal. and yeah, and they wanted a they wanted a carve out. But they uh um uh, and that's that's something uh, I will say that uh, Washington had slaves, a lot of the founding fathers had slaves. There was no country in the world that did not have slaves back then. And it's important to know some people say that our country, uh, you know, was founded on slavery. But what they're not taking into account is we were the first country to abolish so slavery. And, and that's a great thing. And, and, and these guys thing... did helped it. Right. These guys yeah. built a platform that would facilitate it because there's automatically a question. Well, OK, all men. Hey, wait a minute. That guy over there, he's he's a man, but he's black. Why can't he but? And so it started all those conversations, eventually led to our civil war. And uh, then it was straightened out. And then we yeah. got the vote because, well, you know, look, shouldn't man be a, uh, mean, like humankind? If so, why wouldn't women be able to vote? Oh, started that conversation. And it ended up being, uh, I'm sure to add, that uh, it was the right thing. It was a good thing. Absolutely. And that was, so that was something interesting that you taught me earlier when we were talking before we started recording is mm -hmm. I, I did not know this. So uh, previously when, when our country was founded, you had to be a land owner in order to be able to vote. Uh, right. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just men, non-slaves being able to vote. Uh, right. You had to be a landowner specifically. So it's mm -hmm. even interesting that George didn't have the firstborn son rights to his lands. He kind of got some of his initial wealth through Martha. And right. so that's interesting to me how um, things have changed and how that original intention with you had to own land in order to vote, the intention behind it was so that people who were investing in their country would be the ones making the voting decisions. And now it's, right. it's changed. It's um, every, every everybody votes. Well, right. some people choose not to, but everybody can vote. Yeah, and some people may look at that and say, well, why landowners? You know, uh, and I see that a little bit differently. Um, the reason they chose landowners, because it was an easy way to discern what they were looking for. And, and uh, by today's standards, the idea is that if you were a landowner, you, you, you kept a budget, you knew how to handle money, you knew about borrowing money uh, and, and getting paid back and that kind of stuff. And, and you learned about investment. If you're not a landowner, like a day-to-day -day worker who just goes for a paycheck, who doesn't invest anything, back in those days, they were, when you get right down to it, it wasn't they were looking for people with money who owned a property. They were looking for people who were educated, who understood what these things, understood what the struggles were to make a country work. So uh, I thought that was... You know, I used to think, well, that's not landowners. Well, that's not that just that disenfranchises the poor. The more I thought about it, <laughs> well, the just, have land for this, maybe ever. <laughs> right. But that really wasn't what it was about. I don't, in my opinion, it was they were actually trying to make sure that people voted were people who were educated, 
uh, at least about money, so they would understand uh, how a how a country needs to work. Where uh, you know about bringing in money and and using that money to send it places. We're in an environment now, right, where um, during the Revolutionary War, the army served um, almost without pay. They were promised pay, and Congress, uh, the uh, Continental Congress, uh, put levies out to all the states. All the states were supposed to pay to help support the army. They Only a fraction of what it cost was actually given to them. So the, a lot of soldiers... Uh, went without getting paid. They they should have been paid. They risked their life and everything, but they never got paid. And so that so they were aware of that, right? So they're like, okay, we got to make sure that we, you know, I'm sure that Washington would have embraced a balanced budget, for example. You know, we don't spend money we don't have. Well, and that's and that's just the thing is, uh, it's you know, usually my episodes are focused on, uh, you know the future but it's like you can't look at the future without looking at the past and the cool thing is is humans are always we've always been humans and the way we've gone we've gone about things or have spoken about things maybe our language is a little different but the system that they were trying to build in was a system of creating discernment so with that being said there's a lot of interesting um i guess so, so, so uh, I can't say that word, social ideologies um, in the 1700s that are kind of explored in your book. What are some of these ideologies or core political beliefs that you think could really stand the test of time and be applicable to our modern era? Maybe we have to change some of the language around it. Like instead of being a landowner, maybe you have to be a person of discernment. Like you kind of get where I'm going here. Right, right. Yeah, I, in today's world, I don't. This, this comes kind of like to your uh, gut check, right? Your reality check. But it, in today's world, it'd be really hard to take voting rights away from somebody because uh, because they're not very smart. Okay, right, or right. Because not they're not that at all. <laughs> right. But but there's, uh, I think the idea. Um, can't remember if this was before we before we interviewed her, but or after. But Washington, in his farewell address from as president, he said two things. He said, "Beware of political parties." We all know how that turned out. And he also said another one that'd be really something to think about today. He said, "Beware foreign of foreign entanglements. Of, you know, making alliances that don't benefit our country." And if you look at both of those things and you think, golly, was he, does he have a time machine himself that he could come for but, and see that? Oh, maybe maybe he did come into the future and went back with that in mind, right? <laughs> but I and Go ahead. I was just going to say, so with the things that are going on today, here's the thought I wanted, wanted to throw out there. If George Washington came from 1787 to the future, and uh, to the 2037s, okay? And he gets killed or assassinated. So he doesn't go back to, to uh, seven, uh, 1787, doesn't participate in the Constitution, and likely doesn't pass. Then all that we have now is, is not what we're going to end up with. Um, so what foreign powers would benefit by assassinating Washington. Well, I, I could think of three off the top of my head. I could think of Russia. I could think of China. I could think of Iran. Um, three and four? <laughs> uh, well, I think, yeah, that part of the plot develops in those books, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, there would be a lot of people who were, one of the things I wrote down uh to think about while I was writing the book was, okay, who would not want George Washington to come and change the way we do things? And uh, I mean, I'm sure we have a ton of people uh, in government who like it where they are to make a good money and they don't want to give it up. And so uh, what would they be afraid for George Washington to say? And what to what lengths would they go to prevent him from succeeding? Now, there's a lot of ideas there. 
you know, I thought about organized crime and uh, opposition party, whoever they may be. I, uh, and for those who wonder about politics, I try to stay away from from uh, positions of one side or the other. I just try to. Uh, I actually talked about the uh, the uh, majority party and the uh, and the uh, uh, minority party. That's how I talk about them. I don't say who they are. I it, it's irrelevant. Um, there are bad actors all over the place and with different philosophies of government. And uh, so who would not want him to succeed? So when I started thinking about that, I thought, how would how would they act? Ask some of these things, and uh, and I, I would if you want to see something interesting about science, go look, Google the Jetson One, and it is a car. Remember George Jetson, the cartoon with the little flying car. So they developed a uh, a little car, uh, not a car, but it actually is a little uh, flying car with uh, it's all electric. And it has fans like a drum. And uh, it's a one-man deal, uh, one person or one-woman deal. <laughs> well, it carries one person, and it's a recreation, ve- uh, uh, recreation vehicle, basically, because you can go about 30 minutes on one charge. You know, that's where they are today, but they're working on it. And I, I took that and decided to use it uh, in the book, and then I said, you know, if I use that, that I'm going to get sued somehow for something. <laughs> so I changed the name of it. But if you want to see what I was looking at, look at the Jetson One. It's remarkable. They got some great, uh, and I think you can buy one for about eighty grand. That's not on my list right now. Maybe later. Well, uh, I don't know. I'm just now. I'm just thinking about like flying cars. <laughs> like we need to do an episode on that. I keep thinking my Back to the Future car. But like Back to the Future too, when it flies and it runs on garbage, yep. <laughs> that that's the key. So when it's running that on garbage, pretty awesome. that was pretty awesome. That was a fun one. And, and you you just touched on why I went to the twenty five year rule, to the twenty five okay. year multiple. The reason I went to that was there's a scene in Back to the Future where Marty McFly says something like, "I uh, I don't know how I'm gonna. Oh wait, I have a time machine. I can do anything I want. I can fix anything I want." And that's exactly what I did not want. I wanted some urgency. You know, you, you can only have so many times you can go back and try to fix something before it's too late. So that's and why that's, I went with it. Oh, and that's great. Yeah, because I have always thought about that. It's like, man, if you had a time machine, you could, you know, even if you um, need to practice uh giving a presentation it's like you can practice giving it it's like okay i didn't really like my delivery that way let's go back in time let's redo it and we'll redo the wording and it just i think if you have like sort of like an unlimited use time like free range time machine it really kind of eliminates uh that stress and pressure that makes us human it's sort of like this groundhog day where you can just make infinite mistakes and then nothing matters but that's not reality that's you know i i like the idea that there is urgency here you know washington does need to show up and prevent us from this you know we're on the precipice of another civil war here in the 2030s and you know by the time we air this episode it's we're gonna be in january it's gonna be an election year and i know that a lot of um i have Amer- i have listeners all over the world but i know a lot of american audiences do get nervous around this um every four years and a lot of the rest of the world sitting there and holding their breath. Right. So if we were to transport Washington or any of the founding fathers here today, what do you think would be some of their core values or intentions um, that they would really want to communicate to modern day people to help kind of fix some of our current political issues? Well, I think they would look at, uh, a lot of the things we're doing today and realize that uh, government has seriously overstepped their bounds. Uh, they have, uh, uh, back in the history, when they, when they wrote the Constitution, then they had to go sell it to all the states to get them to sign off on it before they could have a union. And uh, so uh, one of the big problems that other people had with it was they had just had an oppressive government 
uh, and they just threw that government off. And that's why they had the uh, Articles of Confederation, because it was a much looser thing. Um, but the problem is it didn't it didn't have the ability. Uh, number one, what, what one of the things Washington was worried about is the articles are not strong enough for us to be able to field an army if we have to defend ourselves again. Uh, you know, uh, God forbid the Spanish, the French, and and you know, by fifteen years later, uh, not fifteen, hmm, about twenty five years later, we had a war with with England. And so we would not have survived that if they had not had a stronger government. And the people were not interested in that. So they made, that's why they made sure to make the Constitution a list of things that the government, that the, that the people will allow the government to do. And, uh, and then the, the last article says something about all other th- powers and laws are the, of the preview, purview, I think is the word. The purview of the states, that the states get to make that decision. That's, um, for example, when Roe versus Wade got overturned, they didn't say it shouldn't be a law. They said it's not in the Constitution. The states need to make their decision about that, which is exactly what's supposed to happen in the Constitution. So, uh, so uh, you know, I, whether that's a victory, uh, a victory or a defeat. You know, it depends on your political persuasion and your thoughts about abortion, right? Um, but the that the decision really was an easy one for, uh, although it was politically messy, it was an easy one to make because it's not in the Constitution, so therefore it must be regulated by the state. So we have we have fifty laboratories, democratic laboratories out there that we use. And when one state does something really well, then the other states see it and go, hmm, that's a good idea. Um, I saw one good idea, and I think it is Alaska who's picked it up. It's called, um, I can't remember the exact name, but it's about voting. And instead, when you vote, uh, no matter where you are in the country, it's managed by the state, but you vote for the top five people, and you and you rank them in order, right? So... Then when they start uh, scoring the election, they see where everybody fits in. Everybody, you know, who are uh, all the first places. They just look at the first places and just count all those and see where they land. Okay. Then the, the one who gets the least vote is dropped out. And then they look at the second choices of everybody and add their votes into the total. And then, again, the, the lowest one's dropped out. So you end up with someone who almost always, no, I think they dis- discerned that always they would get more than 50% of the vote. And that's the big fight we have about electoral college, right? So uh, uh, so I read about that the other day, and I went, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, no, that's I, really interesting. I'll have to look into that more. I'll try to find the link and send it to you. Yeah, that'd be, that'd it, be cool. It was a really interesting idea. Um so uh so that takes the political parties out of it they don't they don't nominate i mean everybody who's running for president gets to run everybody who qualifies to run gets to run and then they uh you know you, and then you score the top five mm-hmm. and, and and you vote once for five people your five choices you know this that guy really interesting yeah so uh and, and i looked at it and i went what a great idea you know and it takes the uh, it takes the electoral college out of it, you know. Right now, there's a big fight about you know, people who win the electoral college but don't win the popular vote. That's happened four or five times in the last ten elections, I think, several times. I know Trump beat Hillary without uh, without having a, ma- a majority of the country. He had fewer votes, but he uh, he. Uh, uh, took great care to go to all the states, which she did not do, um, and uh, and I'm, there are other reasons too, of course. But um, and I think same thing happened to somebody recently. I can't remember who it was. Like there was somebody you wouldn't expect. Somewhere. Yeah, but the whole idea is that's why a lot of people are saying get rid of the uh, uh, get rid of the electoral college, 
But the electoral college is designed so that all the states have a say. And uh, they, uh, you know, they have more representatives in the bigger states. Um, but if you, um, if you take away the electoral college, just go by, uh, by the, um, just the vote count, then the big cities uh, determine who's the, who's the president. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, like, I mean, God bless little North Dakota, right? They, they don't have that many. They got, I think they got one uh, rep, representative and two senators, you know. And but they got a lot of people there, who, uh, but not that many. But their state would be impacted, uh, no matter who's president. So, yeah, that was the idea for the electoral college, and I think it's worked pretty well so far. Uh, yeah, but this we'll has see. Been a really interesting conversation. I definitely feel like the wheels in my head are turning and I feel like my curiosity is being kind of peaked for me to um, learn more about history and politics. I will openly admit these are not my strong suits. I'm kind of like a science and technology nerd, but again, I do not deserve to invest my knowledge into science and technology if I'm going to ignore history and politics because they are very intertwined and they're very important to pay attention to all of them. We are getting close to our reality check moment, but I just want uh -huh. to ask you if there's anything else that you wanted to add in that you think is relevant to our discussion or bringing your story to life before we get to our reality check moment. Well, it's kind of a logistic thing. I wrote it, um, as you see before, I wrote four standalone novels. I wrote this as a series because you know, uh, every time you turn on the television, they're advertising some series, you know, that they're doing. Like Reacher is the big one right now. Um, and uh, it's several different episodes that they, you know, put on weekly, you know. And so that I was thinking, boy, I'd like for somebody to pick this up and make this a series. And so I just kind of naturally tied them together and broke them up that way. It was... Uh, it was a lot harder to do as a series than I thought it was um, because they're not standalone. So if you wait a long time between them, between reading them, then you, you lose the chain of all the people. That's why I put, you know, a lot of books have maybe 10 characters all together. Well, I've got dozens. Uh, and, and you so have a really nice... Um what's it called in the beginning, the cast of characters. So we yeah. can refer to them, you know, yeah. throughout the whole book, which is I really put, nice. I put that because I knew I didn't want to leave anybody sitting there thinking, who is that now? And start, so, oh, maybe it was one of the, in one of the other books. Let me go, what did I do with that book? You know, oh, I loaned it out. Oh, no. You know, so. Well, and if you have the Kindle edition, you can just click their character name and it'll pop up with a box and remind you of who they were. Or if you have a physical book, you can just <laughs> flip to the first page and that'll write right. that with a reminder. Right. And um, so I think that uh, as an author, I had a really good time doing it. I learned a lot. And I, I feel uh, I have the utmost respect for George Washington at this point. And one of my challenges, of course, as I told you, was to make him human and be a human man with faults, but also uh, treat him with the respect he deserves. That was a hard line to follow. Um, I did, uh, there is a, uh, there's one interview with a member of the hostile press with George Washington that I thought, uh, it took a long time to write, but I think it's pretty well done. So we'll see what happens. See what, yeah. I yeah. Hope people, no, I I hope people will comment. I hope they'll, you know, do me a review and, you know, loved it, hated it, whatever. Uh, but just let me know what you think, you know, because uh, I learned more from that than I do from anything else. And, and yeah. I, I have a couple of guys I can count on, uh, a couple of my uh, readers that have read all the books and they've given me good reviews and they'll send me a private message and say, I found a typo on this page, you know, oh. <laughs> so, and which I'm grateful. I go in and fix them, you know. Yeah, no, I, I kind of feel similar with YouTube. I have I have positive comments. They're, wow, these interviews are so interesting. And I have negative comments where people, uh, you know, they were expecting different content and they're disappointed because they wanted more science and less, you know, 
science fiction or they wanted more fiction and less science. You know, it's, you can't, you can't be perfect, but you know, what is going to be perfect is your reality check score. So oh. here we go. <laughs> this is time. So how likely would it be for a founding father to be able to rectify modern problems in politics using our reality check score? You're up, Kim. That's a really good, a good question. Uh, well, first, there's the obvious thing that time travel has to exist. Uh, but the other thing is, when you look around today at the members of, of our government, uh, it, it is my humble opinion that way too many of them are concerned with the political parties than they are the actual thing of the government. So I, I would see, I would think that uh, a founding father would have an impact, but it wouldn't fix all the problems and it wouldn't come close. There would be a lot of people who would come up to say, for example, oh, yeah, he's, he's from 200 years ago. He doesn't know it. He doesn't understand anything about modern stuff, right? Uh, although a lot of the same rules of, uh, of finance, all that kind of stuff, that's still valid rules. But a lot of people talk about modern, modern um, uh, money, uh, mo modern money theory. That's the best way to say it. And, uh, and it's all BS. <laughs> that stuff doesn't change. It's still the same. And uh, so, uh, I mean, you spend more money that, than you got, eventually there are going to be consequences. So uh, I, I think, but I think there's still people who would make excuses and say not. So I'm going to say a two. If you, have, if you have time travel, assuming you have time travel, I'd say like a two. They would be able, to, some people would listen, some people who really wanted to know and really wanted to understand would listen to what he said and weigh it and uh, uh, and then, then act accordingly. But uh, there are people out there now who uh, are uh, entrenched in what they call the deep state. And, and what they really are is they're entrenched on not a particular party, but keeping things like they are for them because they found a way to make a lot of money and be comfortable and, you know, uh, stroke their ego, like being a leader, being in charge, being uh, uh, considered a, a, a great thinker. They're the invested in that. Yeah, the opposite of the servant leader we talked about earlier. Right. And that's, you know, and that's just a reminder to all of us, you know, if, if even George Washington, if we had a time machine and George Washington himself could come back and talk to us, there would still be, um, you know, there'd be the naysayers and the negativity. And that's right. a reminder that the majority of the change has to come from us. And I am chuckling because I always get to this cheesy moment on these shows where every single time I'm just like, hey, guys, you know, change is up to us. It's it's in our teacher's to right. do their best job taking care of the children. It's in the parents to instill good values. It's in the scientists to practice ethical science. It's in right. every single person's job to do your best. And no matter where you're at in this world, if you're a politician or if you are a school, a college student, you can still make an impact in the sphere around you by being a good, virtuous person and taking care of the people in your circle. And that's how we're really, truly going to make change. Because at the end of the day, like we don't have a time machine. We can't travel to a different place and fix things. All we can do is fix what we have in this present time with mm -hmm. what we have. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. I'm going to go back to this podcast and write some of that down. Thank you so <laughs> that's much. That's good stuff. Thank you. So uh, if people do want to buy your book or, of course, you know, so authors, this is a big deal, guys. I'm going to give Kim a plug for for him so he doesn't have to do it for himself. Reviews are a big deal because people are not going to discover books like this unless you write a review. If you are listening to this and you're part of a book club, try to get your book involved in your book club. Talk to your local library. Make sure that this book is at your local library. Because the fact of the matter is that a lot of authors out there like Kim write beautiful masterpieces and I'm really enjoying this. It's well written. The characters, it's it's easy to read. It's a fun sci-fi. It's not as deep and complex as something like Dune or Hyperion, 
but it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's like a young adult either. It's, it's very well written. It's easy to read and it's relatable. And we're not going to get books like this discovered unless I'm doing my cheesy thing again. Like we can do it guys. Unless you, people like you and I try and get more of these smaller books um, promoted. And I think it's a great book and I would love for you guys to read it. Um, write reviews on Goodreads, Amazon. Kim, take it away. Where else could they um, find you or your book? Well, mostly on Amazon. They, they could go to my, uh, my website and uh, get more information. I have a section on myself, which the more I look at, the more I think it's, it's uh, too much information. <laughs> but but I, had, I actually made so, a couple of pages um, that are not showing currently, but one was about the names I used in the story because all the names, almost all of the names, come from my past. They're, they're uh, people I admired or people I knew or whatever. And uh, most of the places um, are, are places I have been to. Uh, I've actually been there. Uh, that I got one scene in Finland where I was there. I was there as an Accenture. I worked for Accenture at the time, and I was on the job there in Finland. And, and it, I thought, this would be a good place for a story. You know, and, and I tucked it away and it was like 10 years before I came back to it. But, uh, um, but then, you know, uh, just different places where I've, I've had stuff in Virginia, you know, I've been to Mount Vernon many times. Um, beautiful place. It is a beautiful place. And, uh, the, my first book takes place mostly inside of an office tower. And it was actually the building that, uh, I used to be in data security for Bell South and it was, the building, the model for the building is the old Bell South Center in downtown Atlanta. Um, and uh, anybody who's been there, I mean, I was in the security department for a while. Mostly, a, most of my career was as a programmer, but they drafted me to help ca help catch hackers. And uh, one of the things I ended up doing a lot of times was doing security evaluations of different places in the building. And so uh, most of the places in the building are places most people can't see, but we saw it. And uh, and they were perfect. I got all kinds of ideas walking around the building, looking at stuff. And go, oh, that'd be cool. You know, <laughs> that's fun. Thank you so much for giving us a window into your creative process. And hopefully you can serve as an inspiration to others um, who are who are trying to be creative themselves. That you can take, you know, you can take from your surroundings and the world that you are living in right now. So thank you so much for listening, everybody. If you have anything that you would have added to this conversation, I know it's political, so I'm sure all of you have a lot of that you would want to say. Please leave a comment and let us know. Till next time, everyone. Thank you for listening. <laughs>